So let's work out the intellect by doing a little bit of metaphysics. This video is called Resurrecting Pythagoras, Why Numbers Are More Real Than Atoms. So it was 10 nights ago that Pythagoras visited me while I lay sleeping. He held a scroll and when I ate the scroll, I immediately experienced the divine numbers at the ground of all being. Existence flowed from these numbers. And in these mathematical and musical vibrations, the joyful secret of life was revealed to the ratio that I am. I then awoke with a simple mission. And my mission was to convert the people of this world to the Pythagorean cult. And so, to convert you, I must first prepare your intellect for the possibility that numbers are ultimately real. So think about this. Are numbers more real than atoms, concepts, or trees? Do numbers first exist and then give rise to points, lines, surfaces, solid, space, time, and all spatio-temporal entities instead of the reverse? While some brilliant mathematicians and philosophers have argued that numbers are the ultimate reality, the apparent from which the universe arises, they support in a way, a position called mathematical realism. And mathematical realism is the idea that numbers exist independent of the mind, and they may be more foundational than atoms or trees. This video will introduce the major arguments and prepare your mind to become an initiate in the Pythagorean cult. Pythagoras has been observing human history since his death. And as I ate the scroll, he first explained to me David Hume. David Hume lived from 1711 to 1776, and he was a famous philosopher who developed a method for determining whether a statement has meaning and what type of meaning it possesses. To understand the method and how it relates to mathematics, we must first understand what Hume meant by the words synthetic and analytic. A synthetic proposition is one that can be traced back to sense impressions, to sensory experience of the empirical world. So an example of a synthetic proposition is, the ship is sinking, because it can be empirically confirmed, traced back to our sensory organs, our sensory impressions. Now on the other prong of Hume's fork, there are analytic propositions, and these are merely relations of ideas. So for example, the bachelor is single is analytic because one knows that's true as a matter of definition. There's no need to confirm it by looking out in the world because we know the bachelor is single based on the definition of bachelor. So that's an analytic proposition. Another way to identify an analytic proposition is to recognize that a self-contradiction arises when you negate an analytic proposition. For example, the bachelor is single is analytic because it's negation it's not the case that the bachelor is single, is a self-contradiction. Hume also argued that analytic truths are trivial because they don't really tell us anything about the world out there, the, the empirical world. They just tell us about the relationship between our ideas. And nor can one confirm analytic truths by looking out into the world. So, in short, synthetic propositions give us knowledge about the empirical world. The ship is sinking. And analytic propositions are trivial and they seem to be merely relations of ideas, like the bachelor is single. So Hume then introduced a methodology known as Hume's fork, a two-pronged fork here. And this fork categorizes all meaningful propositions as analytic or synthetic. Hume believed that if a proposition is neither analytic nor synthetic, then it's nonsense and one should throw it to the flames. So how does this relate to numbers, to Pythagoras, to mathematics? Well, Hume believed that all reasoning about numbers is analytic. This is blasphemy. For example, Hume thought that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is an analytic truth, like the statement, all bachelors are single, because the negation of each is a self-contradiction. It's also analytic because you may look out into the empirical world all you want, but you'll never see, feel, smell, hear, or taste a number. You can see the symbols for numbers, but not the numbers themselves. You'll never have a sensory impression of a number because numbers are merely relations of ideas. So 
Mathematical truths are similar to the rules people create to play games like chess. They're trivially and analytically true. They're not really a feature of the physical, empirical world, or so Hume believed. However, I have eaten the scroll, and I argue thus. If mathematical truths are simply rules that people invent with no independent reality, then why do they work so well in the empirical world? If mathematics is merely a relation of ideas, then why is it impossible to create an applicable mathematics in which it's true that 2 plus 2 equals 5? You know, try to apply that. The obvious problem is that 2 plus 2 equals 5, that sort of mathematics, would not work. If you constructed buildings using this, they would fall down. If you made predictions of heavenly bodies based on this 2 plus 2 equals 5 math, the predictions would be incorrect. But how can mere relations of ideas be empirically incorrect? And the answer, of course, is that mere relations of ideas cannot be incorrect in an empirical sense. So the bottom line is that mathematical truths cannot be a mere relation of ideas because there are empirically correct and incorrect answers in mathematics. So Hume's fork cannot really determine whether mathematical claims are meaningful or real because all three of his options in the fork fail to explain how people know mathematical truths. First, mathematical truths are not synthetic because we don't have empirical impressions of numbers. Second, they're not analytic because they're not trivial truths, lacking empirical verification. And third, they're not nonsense because people believe that numbers and mathematical truths are meaningful and we use them to understand, predict, and control the empirical world. They're an essential part of science, the science that presupposes certain mathematical truths but doesn't prove them. So what are mathematical truths? What are numbers? What Pythagoras wants you to see first is that Hume was incorrect. There's something more to numbers and mathematical truths than Hume thought. So in the last section, the holy arguments prove that numbers and mathematical truths are not mere relations of ideas. Upon understanding this, one common response is that people must discover numbers rather than creating them. They argue that mathematical truths must exist out there in some way because they're empirically correct and incorrect answers in math. Unfortunately, this solution, too, is fraught with difficulties. The first problem is that modern mathematicians do not see, smell, taste, hear, or feel numbers. It makes no sense to say, Bob went to the movies with 27, watched 98, and could not believe the number seven faded like a red ball into the night. It may be entertaining to speak in this way, but the truth is that mathematicians do not discover numbers or mathematical truths like people discover empirical objects, like trees and atoms. So how can one make sense of the idea that mathematicians discover numbers and mathematical truths? Well, one could argue that mathematicians discover numbers in a non-empirical way non-scientific in a way. So perhaps there's a sixth sense that allows mathematicians to discover the transcendent and non-empirical realm of numbers. For example, Plato argued that the intellect gives people access to the mathematical, intellectual, and ultimately real world of forms. People cannot access this world through the senses or the sciences, but it controls everything in the sensory, scientific world, empirical world. The world of forms is like a mathematical blueprint for this empirical world. It's kind of like the programming for the world you experience on your computer screen. Right? Kind of. <laughs> now this is a really interesting hypothesis that, I, that cannot really be empirically refuted since the transcendent is by definition non-empirical. One can only note that it creates more problems than it solves. For example, how does the sixth sense, or the intellect, access this heavenly, transcendent realm of numbers? And what exactly are these number forms? How do they interact with this w spatial world and temporal world? If they're outside of space, how can they interact with things in space or give rise to them? And how many forms are there? And how do they interact with each other? So the problem with this kind of transcendent option that Plato seems to support in some passages is that it multiplies realities. 
and creates more problems than it solves. So to summarize, it's problematic to argue that mathematicians discover numbers in this way because it seems impossible to explain how they discover them. To say that numbers are somehow real and that mathematicians intuitively discover them in a non-empirical realm, <clears throat> to say that is to enter a labyrinth of mere possibilities, mere speculation. In Hume's view, it's to enter the endless cycle of metaphysical speculation. And Pythagoras just told me he agrees. This is a misrepresentation of his position. <clears throat> so a lot of you are probably thinking it's just obvious what numbers are. There's a common sense view here that we need to get to. Pythagoras is so disappointed in the common sense view of what mathematics is. So many of you hold this view and he doesn't understand why you don't question it more deeply. He cries. He's tormented by this. So let's get into this. In sections 1 and 2, the arguments suggested that numbers and the mathematical truths that arise with them are neither created nor discovered. Perhaps then they're constructed. In a way, they're both created and discovered. So the clearest way to develop this idea that mathematicians construct numbers is to examine the history of mathematics. When most historians explain how the ancients developed math, they explain that they did it by interacting with the physical, empirical world and creating symbols to represent the mathematical behavior and characteristics of that physical, empirical world. This is illustrated in Hogben's Mathematics for the Millions. So, for example, they derived geometrical truths as they surveyed land for taxation purposes. Over time, they used symbols to reason in a mathematical way without referring back to the empirical physical world. That is, mathematics is a symbolic system that humans created to represent the behavior and characteristics of this empirical physical world. So this explains why mathematics works so well in the world. The reason engineers can empirically verify math truths and and then show that 2 plus 2 equals 5 is not true is because mathematicians originally derived those truths from the empirical physical world. And this seems to be the common sense view. If two practical-minded people discuss this issue today, they would surely arrive at this conclusion and then change the subject to matters that are more practical. But don't be fooled by these heretics. This type of constructive approach faces serious difficulties. One minor difficulty is it seems that people must already have mathematical knowledge if they can recognize it in the empirical physical world. For example, it seems one must recognize two-ness before one can recognize or create, I'm sorry, the symbol two or count two rocks. That is, people are not creating mathematics. They are simply creating the symbols for the mathematical truths that they discover in the empirical physical world. The problem is this doesn't really explain how they discovered the mathematical truths in the first place. But there's a more serious problem here. The second and more serious problem is that this approach, the constructivist approach, cannot account for the universal, necessary, and empirical nature of knowledge, of uh, mathematical knowledge. So Kant was the first philosopher to argue that one cannot account for these aspects of mathematical knowledge unless human minds are built in such a way that objects conform to our minds instead of being the case that minds conform to our um, conform to objects. Now I'll explore that a little later, but for now let's just try to understand why mathematical knowledge is universal and necessary. For example, 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is necessarily true through the entire universe, right? Universal. No matter where people travel, they know 2 plus 2 equals 4. But how is it possible? Why do you feel so certain about that? Well, it's not possible to derive this type of universal and necessary knowledge, 2 plus 2 equals 4, from experience of the empirical physical world. So for example, imagine a person has seen the sun rise every day of his life. He feels pretty certain it will rise tomorrow. He might even casually say that it feels like a necessity. However, he would be mistaken if he said this because he can imagine the slight possibility that the sun will not rise tomorrow. But he cannot imagine that 2 plus 2 equals 4 will be false tomorrow. The type of knowledge he can derive from the physical, empirical world, the sun rising and setting and so on, that type of knowledge is never as strong as the type of universal and necessary knowledge that he experiences in mathematics. c squared equals a squared plus b squared, 2 plus 2 equals 4, and so on. Therefore, you cannot derive mathematical knowledge from physical, empirical experience alone because there's no finite set of physical, empirical experiences 
that can support the epistemic certainty that you feel with that you have with mathematical knowledge now this is a deep argument it it involves a paradigm shift and Pythagoras is telling me that right now it involves a paradigm shift so take your time to contemplate the difference in certainty that you experience with mathematical claims like 2 plus 2 equals 4, c squared equals a squared plus b squared and compare that and contrast that with empirical claims like the sun will rise tomorrow or the ship is sinking there's a subtle difference and studying Kant can help you see it better it's the key to this argument so to summarize this argument mathematical knowledge is a type of knowledge that carries an absolute necessity to all areas of the universe that's how you feel about mathematical knowledge one's knowledge about the rising sun and all knowledge derived from limited physical empirical experience can never achieve this type of universality and necessity therefore mathematicians cannot construct mathematical knowledge from the empirical physical world according to Kant this also offers a clue as to what one can say about the nature of numbers so it's as if we have these green glasses on green spectacles and we look out at the world and say look the world's green now but you're so certain it's green because you've always had the green glasses on they're irremovable and that certainty can't come from experience of the world it has to come from your spectacles right Otherwise, how could you be so certain the world's green? That's not quite analogous, but that might get you thinking in the right direction. Pythagoras wants me to stop now because I'm getting off topic and to continue in the next video with a little more on Kant and to get closer to what numbers really are.